This video is sponsored by War Thunder. Hey guys, Jesse here. Around the start of 2024, I had a couple commission a chef's knife for me to celebrate their 40th anniversary. Now, I'm a guy that's just barely turned 22, so it's a little hard for me to put into perspective how great of an accomplishment that is, but I knew that I wanted to make something extremely special. Before I can do anything fancy though, I need to make sure that all my steel is clean, and that's what I'm doing on the grinder here. Having some intense deja vu right now. Dark center. As I'm stacking up this first billet, I feel like it would be cool to show you the inspiration for the pattern that I'm going for. Around two years ago, I went to Washington and I studied with Salem Straub for about a week. During that week, he showed me how to make mosaics and do integral bolsters, and during that class, I made this knife right here. Now, I really really like this pattern, but I'm gonna make some small changes to get a slightly different pattern in the end, and I think it might look arguably a little bit cooler. I think I'm gonna angle grind all of this stuff down. That's really bad. That would give me so many cold shots. It might be a little bit hard to tell from the last clip, but this is what it looks like zoomed in, and here you can really see how uneven my pieces of steel are. Usually if they're uneven, it's not too big of a problem, because they're close enough to where if I forge weld them flat, there will be no cold shuts. But these pieces of steel were almost a quarter of an inch off, and if I were to forge weld these, the cold shuts would be so bad that I wouldn't have any confidence in the later forge welding. But yeah, after spending a full 20 minutes on the angle grinder trying to get these pieces of steel to the same level, I went over to the grinder and I used a different muscle group because I was getting really sore from using that angle grinder. If you look closely at the billet, you'll know exactly which layers I put where, because the taller pieces are all 1084 and all the shorter pieces are 15 and 20. I made sure to leave an extra thick bar of 1084 right in the center of the billet so that I could have that nice dark bold line traveling throughout the entire blade. After welding the billet together and grinding off some of the excess weld, it was time to turn on the forge and get ready for the first forge weld. This first billet was so big that it almost didn't fit into my barrel of Parks 50. In the past, I've explained that this process actually helps protect the billet from oxidation, but there's actually one more thing that it does that I don't think I've really ever talked about. After the oil burns off into carbon soot, some of it actually enters the steel. This helps counteract the fact that carbon seeps out of steel at high heat. I grabbed the rebar to flip it and accidentally branded it into my new glove. That's crazy. When the billet reaches forge welding temperature, which is around 2200 to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit, I take it over to the press and I do some really, really light passes. At most, I'm bringing the thickness of the billet down by about an eighth of an inch, but that's all I need to set the welds. Right now, the billet is actually entirely forge welded together and everything after the first heat is just to draw it out. During my last video, I asked if people wanted to hear my forge and fire stories and the overwhelming response was that people really wanted to hear them. So I think I'm gonna tell a quick story right now. When I was on set for the filming of the Gladiators of the Forge segment, they had me staying at a nearby hotel, and every day they gave me a set amount of money for food. We weren't actually allowed to leave the hotel because of COVID protocol at the time, so I used it to DoorDash a meal every night when I got back from set. I DoorDashed everything from McDonald's to sushi, but the one meal that I got the most was penne vodka from a nearby joint. Out of the 20 to 30-ish days that I stayed there, I got the penne vodka more than half the nights. I'm a person that loves eating food that I know when I'm stressed, and it definitely showed in my DoorDash history. I ate a ludicrous amount of penne vodka that month, and I think that eating that much penne vodka consecutively conditioned my brain, and now whenever I'm stressed, I crave penne with vodka sauce and some meat. But back to the builds, I'm using my squaring dies here to start forming the basis for my W's. I went super aggressive here because I wanted the W's to be as elaborate as possible. And as you can see here, I'm not actually doing the regular set of W's. I'm tilting it by about 5 to 10 degrees so that my W's later will end up being a lot more wavy. And don't worry about the thing that looks like a crack at the front of my billet, I think the scale just fell off in a really weird angle and it made it look like a crack, but it wasn't a crack. I'm doing this out of my own free will, that's crazy. The plan for this first billet was to get it long enough and thin enough to where I can cut it into 8 separate pieces and then stack it. The thing is, my starting billet was really big, each of the pieces was 6 inches long as opposed to 4, and I think the entire billet weighed more than the starting billet of my last build, and I complained about it being heavy there. To help standardize the thickness of the billet as it got longer and longer, I used these stop blocks right here. I used a half inch one and a quarter inch one so that I could get a 3 quarter inch billet along the entire length.
Before I started any forge welding, my billet was already pretty unwieldy. I had basically a 12 inch billet with two pieces of rebar attached to the end. It was basically a large sledgehammer that I was flinging around. Once you factor in the fact that my billet was almost three feet long at the end, it really was a lot of extra torque that I had to deal with. It actually got to the point where the billet got so big and long that it couldn't support itself just by sitting in the forge, so I brought over my quench tank and used it as another support. As you can see on my face here, I was getting really tired from wielding this thing, and I think my heart rate went up to around 150 when I was forging this. Before I can mark the lines to cut the billet into 8 separate pieces, I first need to cut off the handle and the trash end at the front. Usually by the first cut, you can tell if the forge welds are good, because on the, the end of the bar is the worst the forge weld would be. We have 29 and 3 eighths of material, what's that divided by 8? My method of measuring out 8 pieces of the exact same length was to get the length divided by 8 and get it on the calipers. Once I marked it with permanent marker, I would have my lines. But I think there's a better method to mark these lines, which is to not mark them at all. I think bandsaws have a stop block feature, but I got mine second hand and when it arrived, it was really bent and I didn't really trust it. Maybe when I get a new shop and a new bandsaw, I'll be able to use that feature and not have to depend on marking lines with my calipers. With all my pieces now cut to the same length, it was time to grind the faces clean and then do a test etch. Like I mentioned before, I did a slight tilt on all of my pieces, so I need to make sure that I line them up perfectly for the next forge weld. It's interesting how it's so much darker in the center. But that's good, we got that bias. Alright, so right now it just looks like a bunch of diagonal lines, but if I flip every other one... get this neat little squiggle, which is what I want. Now that my pieces are test etched and I know which orientation I want them to be for the next forge weld, it's time to surface grind them clean. I was actually on a bit of a time crunch for this build, so rather than a 50 grit belt, I threw in a 36 grit belt. Because my surface grinder runs with belts as opposed to stones, it actually has more variables than you think for the surface grinding operation. I need to do more than just pull the pieces through the belt. The belt needs time to actually cut the pieces, so the speed at which I pull them actually matters. I think this is around the 5th or 6th build that I've done with the surface grinding attachment, and I think I have a pretty good idea of how fast I need to pull things, but I can always improve at it. So my forge welds actually stuck pretty perfectly, but there were a lot of cold shuts near the surface that I had to grind out. I spent an insane amount of time on the grinder, grinding piece by piece, trying to get all of those cold shuts out. I'm not necessarily complaining here, but all I'm saying is I wouldn't have had to do this if my seal was actually one and a half inches wide. I don't think I've ever really talked about it, but I think having a handle with two pieces of rebar instead of one is one of the secret sauces of making good Damascus. Having the two pieces of rebar allows me to know exactly which orientation my piece is at all times, and it makes it so that it doesn't bend when I take it out of the forge. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, and is designed in a way where you can play on both PC and console, for free. You can pick to play as one of over 2,500 planes, tanks, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations, ranging from the Chi Ha LG, which is a tank with a gun larger than itself, to a B-29 Super Fortress that can carry up to 20,000 pounds of ordnance. Everything in the game is extremely detailed, from the sound design to the graphics. Even though you play on a 2D screen, you feel like you're there in real life. The vehicles are also modeled excellently. Both the physics and the weapon execution shows that time and care were put into the back end. With all that said, now's the time to join a worldwide community of over 70 million players in epic PvP battles today and delve into the cathartic experience that is War Thunder. Being at the forefront of high quality military content, there's simply no game better suited for military enthusiasts. Play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox Now by using my link in the description below. New and returning players who haven't played in 6 months will receive a massive bonus pack across all platforms, including multiple premium vehicles, the exclusive vehicle decorator, Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and 7 days of premium account. This offer is available for a limited time only, so don't miss out. With the forge lit, it was time to dip the billet into my Park Sifty again. 
but as you can see here, it was actually too big for my barrel. Luckily though, I had a little bit of extra Parks 50 sitting in this ammo can right here. I actually think this would be pretty interesting to talk about. A lot of new bladesmiths don't use the best quench tanks for their quench oil. I see a lot of bladesmiths using stuff like PVC tubes or like five gallon buckets from Home Depot, but those are really dangerous to use. And if you have anything bad happen, you're gonna have a bunch of hot oil spilling around in your shop. I highly recommend that if you have a welder and access to a steel supplier, you just make your own with a metal pipe and a steel plate. However, if you don't have access to either of those, I recommend buying a used soda keg or just using an ammo can. The soda keg is better because it's taller and you can make longer blades with it, but the ammo can is actually really good for making small hunting knives. The important thing about both of those though is that they're not going to melt if you touch red hot steel to them. Back to the build though, what I'm doing to this bar right now is I'm just drawing it out into a long square bar. The next step is to four way it and I'm not going to be doing any re-squaring just yet, I'm going to be doing that later, so all I have to do is draw it out and it's good. This blade is way too dull. It took four hours to just cut that one slice off. I don't think my bandsaw blade dulled evenly over the course of time. I think I completely obliterated it when I tried cutting the stainless steel in my last video. So this is kind of on me. I've replaced the blades on this thing at least twice before, but somehow in the footage that you're about to see, it looks like I've never done it before. All right, old blade. Ow. I'll fold it later. All right, uh, I need a knife, I don't have a knife. Hello? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I know that I'm supposed to loosen these guards, but I don't want to. I got this bandsaw second hand, and it already came with a blade attached to it, but it didn't come with an instruction manual. The blade was really dull, and it was tensioned so weirdly that no matter how much I tighten it, it would always fall off the wheels. I ordered new blades on Amazon, but the blade that they gave me was actually the wrong size in the right packaging, so it was a really big hassle to get this thing set up for the first time. With the billet now cut into four even pieces, it was time for another test etch. The belt that I'm using here is another dull 120 grit belt. I better see what I want to see. I'm gonna be a little miffed. That's what we like. Got that. If you look super closely in the last one, it was actually really important for me to only cut the first billet into 8 separate pieces. If I were to cut it into 9 separate pieces, the wiggles wouldn't match up as I stacked them on top of each other. If I had an odd number of pieces, the central wiggle would be a lot wider than I needed it to be, and they would be on the same side. So it was really important that I had an even number of wiggles in an amount that would make it interesting. For this next forge weld, I only welded the front end and the back end of the billet. I didn't weld the sides at all. The oil coating would help enough with preventing oxidation, and my pieces were pretty much exactly the same size, so I didn't need to worry about them slipping at all. One thing that I have to keep in mind here is that the top of the billet heats up faster than the bottom side, so I need to flip it every now and then, and you can see that in the discoloration there. To set the forge weld, I'm using my squaring dies. I could have done this on my big flat dies, but the squaring dies help guarantee that I have a good forge weld in the center of the billet. I can also do this with the flat dies, but since I have the scoring dies, I'm using them. The flaky stuff that you see falling off the side of my billet here is known as scale. Scale is basically a really thick layer of rust that appears when you take it out of the forge and the surface oxidizes. 
Now the reason that my scale looks so thick and it appears so fast is because I'm forge welding at such a high temperature. At the higher temperatures, the oxygen diffuses much faster and deeper into the steel, and this is actually the biggest cause of material loss when making Damascus. The plan for this next billet isn't actually to 4 weigh it, it's actually to 6 weigh it, which is a 2x3 weld. I've never done a 2x3 weld, and because it's not square, I can't use my squaring dies later, so it's going to be really interesting to see how I can do that. Because I need to cut this billet into 6 separate pieces rather than 4, I bring it down a little bit less than the 1.5 inches of the last billet. I bring it down to 1 and 3 eighths inches. Okay, 13 and a quarter divided by 6 is... 2 inches and it's slightly less than 0.2. Each of these is 6.63, so I'm going 2.21 on each of these. It's going to be a really short billet. This is in Forge and Fire, so don't yell at me for being on my phone here. I wish there was a way to buy thinner bandsaw blades so that I wouldn't like waste so much material in the cut. All right, so I can't necessarily test etch just the front of each because that would not hurt. I need to do it in like sets of two, so I need to do it like this. That way I have like matching patterns. For this test etch, I once again brought all the pieces to 120 grit belt finish. All right, I actually have no idea what this is going to look like. I hope it looks cool. Damn, look at that. I either want it to look like this, or like, I think, I think this one's better. To clean up these pieces for this six-way weld, I actually couldn't use the surface grinder because the pieces were short enough to where they were getting caught in between those magnet channels. I had to go back to my good old welding magnet and stand at the grinder for about 45 minutes cleaning up those pieces. Because this is the final forge weld before the tile weld, I welded up all the seams just to guarantee that all my forge welds were 100% perfect through the entire billet. Before I welded the handle onto this final billet, I took it over to the grinder and I ground the welds basically entirely flat. I didn't need the welds to do anything other than protect against oxidation, and a thick weld will just press itself into the billet. One of the things I make sure to do every once in a while is to lube up my press dies. This is super important to ensure the longevity of the guides and the press itself. Did I just miss? There we go. To set this strange looking 2x3 forge weld, I started off with the flat dies, but I wasn't gonna just set them on the flat dies. The plan was to bring it down to the cross section of a square and then go to the squaring dies. Technically, I don't think going to the squaring dies was necessary after setting them that far with the flat dies, but I wanted to ensure that the forge welds at the corners were perfect. When I was 100% confident in the quality of the forge welds, it was time to bring it down in thickness just a little bit before I do a re-square operation. The interesting thing about this rescore operation though was that it wasn't supposed to be at an exact 45 degree angle. The thing is, this bias isn't meant to make the individual tiles look cooler, it's supposed to make the entire blade look cooler when I have the tiles next to each other. This operation was definitely a little bit sketchy, so I wish that I had one more set of dies to help me do this a little bit better. I wish I had another set of squaring dies that is a lot smaller than my original set of squaring dies. This would help me clean up the sharp corners on my billet, and it would help me guarantee that the cross section was perfectly square without any rhombusing. I'm trying to think about which direction I want to make the long and which I want to make the short side. After spending more time than I would like to admit trying to orient the billet, I finally took it over to the press and I drew it out to its final dimension. I think my final billet ended up being an inch and a quarter thick and an inch and five eighths wide.
After the billet cooled down over the course of several hours, I took it over to the bandsaw, cut off the handle, and then I took it over to the surface grinder and I ground all of the surfaces clean. These surfaces would end up being the connection point between the tiles later, so I needed to make sure that the finish was as good as I could get them. Like always, I set my bandsaw at 35 degrees so that I can get the optimal tiles for tile welding. I think I want to go 0.55 thick on each. Actually, I'll go 0.6. I don't trust myself. Even though this time I was extremely careful and I got all my tiles to pretty much the exact same thickness on the bandsaw, I still wanted to get them on the surface grinder so that they were exactly the same thickness. And this mosaic pattern is actually a little different from a regular mosaic, so I had to do a test set here. From what I can tell, this is exactly what I was trying to do, so... I think it'll play out well. All right, so right now the pattern goes like diagonal across all of these, which would look cool, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this one, I'm gonna flip it so that it goes down, goes back up, goes down. So now it's like this. Now that my pattern was adequately theory crafted and laid out, it was time to prepare the sheet metal for the tile weld. I mentioned in my last video that I didn't like cutting sheet metal with the sheet metal cutter because it sort of bent the metal, but this time I didn't really have a choice because the piece was too big to fit in the bandsaw. Like always, I ground the sides of my sheet metal flat and I ground the surfaces clean so that they would eventually forge weld themselves to the tiles. As I weld together my final billet, I figured that I'd talk about how you can actually buy a knife of mine. It's kind of strange, even with 8 full build videos out, I've never even mentioned it once. In the past, I've done things on a commission basis, where people reach out to me via email, but I'm trying to move away from commissions and just selling blades that I want to make on my website. The cool thing is that I have a mailing list where I'll announce when I have a new blade available on my website, and you can join it at the link in the description below. I mentioned in the past that there's really no need to dip this billet in oil because I've welded around the entire thing already, but I'm only using a flex core welder and the flex core isn't super good at making airtight seals, so I dip it in the oil anyway. To set these welds, I take a first pass that is extremely, extremely light. I'm not bringing the billet down by more than maybe a 32nd of an inch. I forge weld my tile welds a lot differently than my classic forge welds. I mentioned before that after the first heat on the forge welds that they're basically pretty much set, but I don't think that's necessarily the case for tile welds. I basically baby them 100% of the time. When I'm sure my forge welds are pretty much set, I take it over to my post vise and I use my angle grinder and blow off all of that extra material. This extra material is just extra weld and the sheet metal, so I don't necessarily need it in my billet. After I ground the billet clean, it was clear to me that there were like two or three minor forge weld flaws on the sides of my billet. I could have probably ground through these, but I decided to fix them with my hand hammer because I didn't want to cause any extra distortion. At first glance, it may seem like my 25 ton hydraulic press is better at setting forge welds than a hand hammer, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than you might think. When I set forge welds on my first billet, all of the steel is already clean, so there's nothing I have to blast out. In my case, I'm trying to repair a forge weld, which means I have to blast out a bunch of liquefied scale from in between the layers, so it's better to have an impact than a press. The plan for this chef's knife is for it to have an integral bolster, but you're probably wondering where that bolster material is actually going to come from. 
Those of you that have seen my making a mosaic Damascus Cleaver video already know how I'm going to do it, but for those who haven't, I'm going to be forge welding on my bolsters. Before I can do that though, I have to isolate the material that I'm going to have for my tang and the bolster. I moved the bulk of the material on the press with some offset dies, but then I took it over to the anvil and the hand hammer to finalize the shape. This is one of the cases where I'm extremely happy that I learned all of my forging with a hand hammer. As you can see there, I was using a crossbeam hammer to start drawing out my heel. The heel on a chef's knife is one of the most important parts to get to dimension, and in my case, I wanted to draw it out a little bit before I forge welded the bolsters on. To get ready to forge weld my bolsters, I first need to clean the blade off a little bit. All of the mild steel cladding that I put on the blade at the beginning of the tile weld is still there, and I need to grind through that so that I can have the bolsters forge weld onto high carbon steel. Alright, I ground off a lot of material, but there's that chance that I still didn't grind off enough. Ooh, we're actually pretty close. So you can see, like, we can see the pattern on the top and the bottom, but not right here. It kind of looks like cow spots. So just a little bit more grinding and then we're ready to put the bolsters on. In this case, the test etch is basically like an x-ray and I can see exactly what my steel is doing. But yeah, once I get the rest of that sheet metal ground off, it's time to start prepping the material that I'm actually going to forge weld to the blade. These bolsters are actually made from the exact same mosaic as the blade itself. They're just a little bit thinner than the original tiles and I have to grind off those corners so that they're rectangular rather than parallelogram. As for getting these secured to the blade for the forge welding, I just do two light tacks on each bolster. I don't need to do too much at all. This is one of those cases where I don't actually have the best tools for the job. The best tool here would be a TIG welder, where I could TIG around the entire bolster so that no oxygen can get inside, but I wouldn't introduce any forward materials. To set these welds, I first start off by hitting in the center, and then I go to each of the corners of the bolsters. And as you can see here, the bolster that starts on the bottom actually gets a lot cooler, so I need to make sure to do multiple forge welding heats. With the bolsters now forge welded to the blade, it was time to start drawing out the tang. I did this on the press with the combo flat dies, but once again, I could have done this on the anvil with the guillotine tool and a hand hammer. To prepare for forging the blade, I take it over to the anvil and I straighten everything out so that I can have something to grab while I'm actually forging the blade. So this blade is going to be yet another Santoku style chef's knife, but rather than an 8 inch chef's knife, it's going to be a 10 inch chef's knife. I gave myself a lot of material when I cut my tiles. I cut them to around 0.6 inches thick each, and that means I essentially had enough material to make a bowie knife. I think now's a good time to talk about what I think about when I'm actually forging the blade. A lot of people like to forge exactly to dimension when they're forging their blades. This includes cross-section and profile. And there's also the people that do the exact opposite. They forge a big blob and then they basically cut out their profile later. I do something that's a little bit in between both, but leaning towards the side where I forge the profile. Now, this is mosaic Damascus, so I can't forge exactly to shape even if I wanted to, because that would lead to unnecessary distortion of the pattern. That being said, I still forge the blade mostly to shape, minus parts of the heel and the very tip. Heel is at like two and a quarter. I've mentioned before that working on katanas and bowies is basically like a training arc for my chef's knives, but in working on those, I sort of boofed my memory and I ended up doing the order of operations a little bit wrong. I should have gone to the press first to draw out the heel material before I went to the hand hammer, but I ended up making the process a little bit harder than it should have been. We're still only at nine. Here's a cool trick for you bladesmiths out there. As you can see, the top of my spine here is bowed out a little bit past the top of my bolster. I'm trying to bring that down, but I also don't want to mess with the heel height. So what I'm doing here is I'm tilting my hammer back, decreasing the area of contact, and moving that material down, and because the area of contact is decreased, it won't change the height of the heel. That being said, it might affect it slightly if you hit it too hard, so play things by ear. Alright, after 
three days of forging, the shop's a little filthy. I wonder how big of a pile of dust we can make. Oh my. I've seen a lot of comments under my videos asking if I can turn this scale back into steel. And I think it's actually possible. A lot of the old smelteries use iron ore, and a lot of iron ore is basically just iron oxide. These smelteries don't just melt the iron oxide though, they reduce it with carbon monoxide, and they produce iron and carbon dioxide. With the blade cooled down and the shop clean, it's time to profile the blade and get ready for some nice normalization cycles. If you've been here since day one and you've seen me build my Damascus on my Kukri, then what I'm about to say is going to be a repeat, but it's so important that I can't help but say it again. I believe that blade profiles are like faces. If you make one small change to them, you're going to get an entirely different blade or face. One of my dirty little secrets is that before I do any blade profiling, I spend a lot of time observing other people's work, even my past work. This makes it so when I go to profile my current piece, I know exactly what looks good and what doesn't, and I know exactly which lines I can play with to create a new profile that still looks good. From what I can tell so far, all of my forge welds are pretty perfect. At the end of the bolsters though, there's a tiny, tiny little bit of not sticking, but that's fine because I was going to grind it forward anyway. Yeah, the tile welds look good along the entire length of the blade, and I have a lot of meat. Uh, it doesn't matter that there's like a tiny warp. Before I can do the normalization though, I want to grind off all of the sheet steel on both sides of the blade. I've read a comment recently that actually made a lot of sense. When I go to normalize it, like I said in the last video, I'm normalizing the carbon across the entire length of the blade. If I still have the sheet steel on the outside of the high carbon steel, I'm just going to be stealing carbon from my blade steel. Now, I know that I've already been forging this at a high temperature for a decently long time, so some carbon has already diffused, but it's probably not all the way diffused, and I want to mitigate it as much as I can before I do the actual normalization. I wanted to try to hammer out a bit of a warp on the first normalization cycle, so that's what I'm doing here. The first cycle I did at 1650 degrees Fahrenheit. In between the cycles, I let the blade cool to around 800 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The second and third cycles I did at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit and 1350 degrees Fahrenheit respectively. If you look super closely at the blade here, you can see ripples of heat moving back and forth across the blade. That's called recalescence, and it's because the steel is undergoing phase changes as it cools down. With the grains all normalized and the blade more relaxed than it was after the forging, it's time to do a little bit more grinding. As you can see here, I went into the normalization with clean steel, but I came out of it with a bunch of new scale. My goal for this grinding is to get rid of all this scale, finalize the profile just a little bit more because it could have warped a little bit in the normalization, and to bring the blade thickness down so that I don't have as much grinding after the quench when everything is super super hard. When I'm removing the bulk of material, I like to alternate between grinding edge up and spine up. Because when I grind edge up, I basically remove material only on the bottom half of the blade, but if I do spine up, then I get the other half. This gives me a slight convex, which is something that I want for the final ground knife, but not necessarily what I want going into the quench. So I have to just keep this in mind as I'm grinding and bringing the thickness of the entire blade down. The last thing that I do before actually going to the quench is I break the corners on the slack belt with a higher grip belt. This reduces basically any stress concentration that could result in a crack. Yep. 
in the space. Oh yeah, that's hard, but like, I don't even need to test it. Oh, okay. Alright, we're out of the temper. I'm gonna see how much this weighs. That's pretty crazy. I need to take off like, like right now it's three times the weight that I want it to be. So the quench actually went really well. If you heard some small pops during the actual quench, that was just the scale popping off. It wasn't a crack or anything. And that brings me to the next step of the process. From the quench, I got a decent layer of decarb because that's just how quenches work. And what I'm doing right here is I'm grinding off all that decarb so I can go straighten the blade. Without the decarb, the blade is basically it's pure straightness. There's nothing pulling on it that wouldn't be pulling on it later. So it warped a little bit in the heat treat. You can see there's a bit of a bow. And sometimes the bow looks different looking at it from either end, but... Yeah, so I got it flat, I think I'm gonna straighten it. So the way that I'm straightening this blade is I'm using my carbide ball peen hammer, and I'm not just hammering it randomly. If you look closely, I'm hammering across the width of the blade. This will make it so that I don't accidentally put a twist into the blade. So at this point, it's straight enough to where I can actually grind it straight perfectly. Like there's a straight line in there somewhere, but I think I want to make my life even easier and straighten it a little more. That's pretty damn good. Yeah, I can work with that. To prepare for the removal of the final material, I need to scribe a couple lines. Right now, everything is as square as I can make them with my eye, and my eye is decent, but it's not perfect. And if I scribe lines, I can get it perfect. I gotta grind that all the way down there. Right now is the time where I usually notice how thick my tang is. When I forge things, I always think that they're a lot thinner than they are, and then later, when they cool down and I have to grind them, there's a lot more material than I have to remove. In terms of this being a problem or not, I don't really think it's a problem, but it's just an annoyance because the thicker something is, the more you have to work with. And I mentioned before that you can't add material to something, you can only take away. With the tang now thinned down and also in line with the spine, it was time to turn my attention back to the blade. I weighed the blade earlier and it was around a pound and a half, and I want to get this thing down to way less than a pound. I feel like there's a couple schools of thought in terms of chef knife geometry. There's the people that do the complicated B grinds, S grinds, there's the people that do the convex grinds, and there's people that do flat grinds. On top of these categories, there's also the complex Japanese grinds like the Yanagiba, which has a hollow on the back, you have the single bevel, you have the double bevels, you have the differing sharpening angles even with the same bevel angles, and yeah, there's just so many. I hogged off so much material, but... It's still pretty thick. Yeah, I already took off like five ounces. That's insane. One of the things that I spend a lot of time on is the bolster blade transition. If this doesn't look good, then the blade just looks off. A lot of people like to grind this with a contact wheel and to have it round, but I'm a bigger fan of the flat grind into the flat grind. Excuse me. There we go. I'm not a super big fan of super long bolsters. Honestly, I don't know why I gave myself so much material on this bolster. Like I always overestimate it and I always end up having too much. Wow, that's like perfectly 90 already. Just kidding. The point of the file guide on the bolster right now is so that I can get the back of the bolster perfectly flat. This will make it easier to combine it with the wooden block later. Technically speaking, I don't need the file guide. If I were really, really good on the grinder and I could get it perfectly flat by eye, then I could just do that. But the file guide makes it a lot easier and reduces the variables. All 
All right, so at the heel, I'm currently at 14,000th. A little further up, we're at, that's 10,000th already, wow. At the tip, we are at 13. And I think on the spine, we're at 160,000th, 138,000th, 111. Honestly, I don't know if I want to get the spine too much thinner. For a bigger blade, I don't want a super thin spine. All right, so this platen's actually a little bit worn in. If you look here, there's like, there's like a divot, which means if I'm grinding on it, that divot's gonna appear in my piece. So I think I'm gonna flip this around. Woo! Yeah, this side is flat. So it might seem a little strange as to why I just did what I just did. Belts don't actually have their own shape, so they sort of follow exactly what's backing the belts. That's why you can have things like contact wheels and different radii and flat platens. The lucky thing about my grinder is that the platen can actually go forward and backwards, and because I only use one side, I could just flip it and get to a fully flat surface while flipping it. But yeah, to prepare for putting on the actual handle and hand sanding later, I bring the belts up to a 400 grit Trizac belt finish. You definitely don't need Trizac belts to get a good finish before hand sanding. The only reason that I'm using these is because I was interested in them and I bought them a while back. They actually last a long time, so that's why I'm still using them today. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do it. Let's do brass, bronze, brass. For the spacer, rather than just doing one layer of brass or one layer of bronze, I decided to do a little bit of both. A lot of makers, when they do a sandwich spacer like this, they decide to choose two colors that contrast a lot, like brass and maybe a black G10. But I wanted something a little bit more understated and I wanted something that you had to look closer at to see the, the extra detail. Once again, I'm extremely happy that I finally have one of those portable band saws. It just makes this process so much easier. One of the common comments that I get is, Jesse, why are you scribing with your calibers? And I guess I really never understood this. What else am I really supposed to scribe it with? Okay, just so I can visualize what's going on because I can't remember all these numbers. All right, we got an off-center slot that I need to carve. This right here is 0 0.2165. That right there is, I don't know. This right here is, what was that again? I need to add an eighth of an inch to this, and I need to subtract eighth of an inch from this to get the center dots there. All right, if my math is right, that is 0 0.3415, and this right here is, oh god, uh, seven, god, wait, am I stupid? I've talked about getting a mill a lot on this channel, and as you can see here, I'm scribing a bunch of lines, I'm gonna be center punching later, I'm gonna be carving these with drills, and then I'm gonna be like filing them for days. If I had a mill, I could just remember some numbers, put them into the machine, and just watch the slot appear. Obviously, I know machining is a lot more difficult than that, so don't roll your eyes at me too hard. Alright, let's drill. Even though I know my way around a drill press decently well, I don't necessarily know all of the lore behind the drill press and the best drill bits. The good thing is, I know a lot of my audience knows their way around a machine, and can probably give me some suggestions on what better drill bits are. If the thing stopping you from leaving a comment down below is that you think I won't see your comment, don't let that hold you back. I read every single comment without fail. I may not be able to respond to every single one, but I do still read all of them. I don't know how I did that, but that's kind of impressive. Wait, that was so fast. I think I want to use this file. Right now all I need to get is the corners. Because of my past trauma, filing 3 quarter inch thick stainless steel, this felt like a breeze. It felt like everything was going so fast and it felt like I was making so much progress. That being said, filing still isn't the most fun thing I can do, and I wish it could still go faster. 
Oh my god, wait. All things considered, that's really good already. This operation right here might look like sacrilege, and it might feel like cutting corners, but there's actually nothing wrong with it. None of this material that I'm removing will ever expose itself after the blade is glued up, and this procedure right here will help me save a lot of time when I go to fit up this to the back of the bolster. Oh, okay. That's pretty close, but I think I want to fit the other two before I do final fit ups. All right, fingers crossed. Boom. Boom. It's going to look pretty sick. All right, for this handle, uh, I can choose between these two. They're both in Boinio Burl, but this one is much darker. And I think I want a darker piece of wood to, to match. Up. Yeah, I think I want to use the darker one because it'll help bring out the, the bright spacers more. I got these two beautiful blocks of wood from Ben at Greenberg Woods. He sources and cuts some of the highest quality wood that I've ever seen, so make sure to check him out at the link in the description. And make sure to also use code JHU at checkout to get 10% off your order, and to also let him know that I sent you. With an adequately sized wood block cut from the bigger block, it was time to square this block up and get it ready to carve the slot for the tang. There's something that I do want to clear up regarding handle making. I see a lot of comments asking, how come you're not doing a full tang construction on these high-end expensive knives? So full tang construction is definitely functionally stronger than a hidden tang construction, but the knives that I make don't necessarily have that strength as their most important attribute. Everything that these will be used for, the hidden tang construction is more than strong enough for. I wouldn't be able to do the hidden tang guard fit ups that I did on my bowies if I did a full tang construction, and I wouldn't be able to do the spacers like I did on the chef's knife if I did a full tang. My methodology for drilling this hole was a little bit different than I usually do it. I knew that I could make the hole slightly oversized and have the epoxy fill in some of the gaps. This isn't necessarily bad because I think the epoxy is stronger than the wood anyway. It's probably a little bit late in the video for me to be saying this, but I'm recording all of the voiceovers for this video with a cold. And you can probably hear it in my voice, but if you didn't, well, now you know. But yeah, back to the builds. Now that I have all three holes drilled for the tang, it's time to use some sideways pressure on the drill bit to connect these holes. This step was actually the biggest step that stopped me from doing hidden tang handles in the first place. When I first started making knives, all of them were full tang. I just didn't want to have to deal with drilling inside the wood where I couldn't see. I have the depth and the, the width, I just need to broach out those corners. Those brooches that you saw me using earlier to scrape out the corners were actually homemade. They were made from an old brown file. I don't actually know if you can buy these from a manufacturer like the ones that blacksmiths use. So I think most people that do this just make their own brooches. Oh my god, we got like a millimeter. Please? What are you getting stuck on? Everything is like perfectly square, but the top spacer has like a couple thousandths of inch of gap. All right, I'm gonna fix that and then we're ready for glue.
no gap. Zero gap from all angles, from all spacers. That's what we like. Before the glue up, I make sure to notch the tang with some deep notches with the corner of a 36 rip belt. This will make it so that the handle never falls apart even without a pin. I feel like this is one of those life hacks for getting a stronger bond with epoxy. All you have to do is clean your pieces. If you have oil on your pieces, the epoxy doesn't bond as well to the pieces that you're trying to connect, and cleaning the pieces just makes it so that that's not a variable. Everything's cleaned. Alright, there's only going to be epoxy holding this together for the next who knows how many decades, so... I need to mix this really, really well. Ah! I should really be wearing gloves for this. This is the last video I'm making before early 2025, so I think I'm going to reiterate what I said in my last video. I'm currently finishing up my last semester at the University of Michigan, and after this, I'm actually going to be doing YouTube full-time. That being said, I need video ideas for 2025, and I already have a couple, like I'm going to be making another katana from One Piece. I'm not going to say which one it is just yet, but I think that's going to be a really awesome video. I've heard people say that they really want me to make more video game weapons, and I think that would be really cool, so leave some comments below on which video game weapons or movie weapons that you want to see me make. Good. Oh! Alright, I think it's been 24 hours. Maybe? Question mark. Damn, what did I do to my finger? It kind of hurts. Oh yeah. Let's go grind. I want to try something like this, where I have three facets in the front going to two facets in the back. I need to figure out how to do this transition here. I don't think these lines actually make sense. It might be pretty obvious that I've never done a handle construction with that 3 to 2 facet combo because those lines that I drew were completely backwards. Making these knife handles is essentially just sculpting. It's the same thing if you do it in marble or if you do it in wood. And the first step for making these handles, at least for me, is to establish some nice reference surfaces that I can reference off of later, hence the term reference surface. One of the things that I always do, because I hate having too little material, is I make my handle block longer than I know it has to be. This makes it so that when I get to this step right here, I can just cut off any extra and maybe use that for a bolster later. This block that you see me rubbing against the belt here is actually known as a belt eraser. It's this really tough rubber that helps dislodge all of that wood dust and debris from the abrasive on the belt. If you're only grinding metal with your belts, then you don't really need a belt eraser, but if you're grinding wood, it really helps dislodge all of those wood particles and help the belt not burn the wood. Because the bolster on this knife is also made from hardened steel, I need to be extremely careful about not heating it up too much. If the epoxy in the handle gets heated up too much, it can actually become slightly gummy again. And if that happens, the handle is going to become loose and I really don't want that. One of the things that I look for when grinding the front of the handle is a nice transition into a pinch grip. A lot of people when they make shaft knife handles, they leave the front of their handles really big and I just can't imagine how that would be comfortable in any kind of grip. I actually blundered a little bit when I was shaping this handle. My brain sort of went on autopilot and just automatically went to grinding the shape of the handle that has the three facets in the back as opposed to two facets in the back. I ended up thinning down the back slightly more than I wanted to, but luckily I didn't affect the final geometry of the handle at all and it ended up being exactly what I wanted it to be regardless. Here you can finally start to see that bevel in the back get super defined. I'm super happy with how it's looking, but there's still a lot more work to do. I think I've decided on a placement for the facet points. Right now it's right here, 
but I'm gonna push that up so that it's right here. I have that on the other side where the point meets here and the point meets there. So I wanna sort of replicate it on this side and push this up there. As you can see, the process for getting these facets onto the handle is a little bit more complicated than you might think. Not only do I have to get them looking good on one side, but the other side has to be exactly the same. It's not shown on camera, but there's so much time where I just spend looking at the handle, inspecting it, flipping it from side to side, and ensuring that everything is perfect. The next step in the process is the final hand sanding before I can do any etching. So here I'm cleaning up all of the corners, cleaning up the choil, and making sure everything at the front of the bolster is rounded so it doesn't dig into the user's hands. Every surface on the blade is going to be at 400 grit before any sanding. One of the things that I started doing recently for my chef's knives is I thin down the edge before I do any of the hand sanding. If you look super closely, the angle at which I'm doing this at is a lot shallower than if I was actually putting a final edge on. The final edge at this angle would be super weak and it wouldn't really have any utility. Right here I'm just making sure that the edge is thin so that it cuts well later when it has that final secondary bevel. I really need a knife making vise. This works, but it's kind of, kind of the worst, you know? This is probably the furthest into the knife making process that I've done all my hand sanding. Usually I hand sand the blade somewhere in the middle of the process and then I hand sand the handle later, but this time I pushed it all the way to the end. All right, this is a little high. My elbow's kinda hurt, so I'm gonna do this. For the hand sanding this time, I started off at 220 grit and then I brought it all the way up to 600 grit. This is pretty standard for me and honestly, I didn't really wanna try anything different for this blade. One way of showing that the knife edge is actually really thin is I can just use my nail here and I can just deflect it like that. The fact that I can do this with my nail means it's really, really thin, and that's really important for a chef's knife, so. And one year burl actually has a lot of small imperfections, and I'm filling them with medium thick black super glue. These impurities are small enough to where they don't affect the durability though. I feel like Blacktail Studio. Once the super glue all cures, I actually go to a file before I go to any sandpaper. This super glue is actually like gummy enough to clog up all of the sandpaper that I use, and I want to make sure to get it at least flat before I go to sandpaper. At this point, the entire handle was unsanded, which means both the metal and the wood needed to be sanded. I decided to sand the wood first and then move to the bolster because the wood sands a lot faster than the metal and it kept my morale decently high. Throughout the entire hand sanding process of the handle, I wasn't just looking to get everything to a higher grip finish. I was also finalizing the geometry. This means a couple things for my actual hand sanding process. The first of which is that I had to use a hard backing and I couldn't layer the sandpaper a bunch. And the second thing was that I had to keep looking and checking that I wasn't taking too much material off of one of the sides, and I had to make sure everything was symmetrical. What I'm doing here is I'm fully rounding out the choil. I already broke the corners on the grinder, but a fully rounded out choil is so much more comfortable than just broken corners. The thing is, because it's round, there's technically an infinite number of facets that I have to sand, and it takes a lot longer to get up to the finish that I want. The last thing that I have to do before I can move on anything else is I actually break all the corners with 600 grit. This will make it so that there's no part on the handle that can hurt the user. Clean this area first. Got my traditional stencil. Oh, it's not plugged in. All right, let's do this properly this time with actual current flowing through. Oh yeah. With the maker's mark fully etched in, it was time to clean it up with a piece of 5,000 grit sandpaper. Well, it's, it's not sandpaper, it's a sanding pad, but it does the same thing. And then I take some brass black and I darken it completely before sanding it flat. Ooh. I think that's the most crisp maker's mark that I've ever done, like of my own name. With my maker's mark darkened and pretty much finalized, it was time to actually buff the handle. I was going to be etching the Damascus with the handle fully finished, and it's under my impression that a fully buffed handle resists the ferric and the coffee better than a non-buffed handle. 
I don't necessarily have any evidence to support this, but I think it'll work, so it'll probably work, right? That looks so good, holy shit. It's finally time to etch the Damascus. I make sure to clean it super well before it goes into the ferric. Alright. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Oh my god. Dude, look at that. It's like a... It looks like a dragon. Seeing as this pattern has probably never been made in the same way before, it doesn't have a name. I reached out to some friends on Instagram for some name suggestions, and the one that stuck with the most was Kaleidoscope Mosaic Damascus. If you know what a kaleidoscope is, you'll probably see what I mean when you look super closely at the pattern. There's so much detail, and there's so much chatoyance, that it really does look like a kaleidoscope. For this blade, I'm doing two cycles of ferric etch, and then I'm doing one cycle of coffee etch. I make sure to sand the blade up to 2500 grit in between the two ferric etches, removing all of those dark oxides. Alright. I didn't show this on camera, but I have to sand more than just the flats of the blade. The bolster is also Damascus, which means I have to sand all the oxides off every single angle of the bolster. excited for this. Hopefully it turns out well in, in three hours. It's been four hours. All right, let's see what we got. Please, please, please. Oh my god. That's not real. There are a lot of things that I loved about this project. The kaleidoscope mosaic pattern came out looking so insane, with the organic waviness and the deep contrast after the coffee etch, and the handle ended up being better than I could have ever hoped for, with its sharp facets, dark rich colored wood, and the integral bolster made from the same Damascus as the blade. My clients, I hope you enjoyed this 40th anniversary gift, and I hope the blade treats you well. And to you, the viewer, I hope you enjoyed watching me make this blade from start to finish. With all that said, I present to you the finished chef's knife.
Oh my gosh. Again, thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to play it for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox Now by using my link in the pinned comment or video description. New and returning players who haven't played in 6 months will also receive a massive bonus pack across all platforms, including multiple premium vehicles and other goodies, available for a limited time only, so make sure not to miss it.